right, of two books. The, uh, sorry, I had my mic turned off. Imagine that. Muhammad Ali, the greatest, and King Midas in reverse. So for many years, uh, Ben was a uh, film critic and writer for FilmMonthly.com, where he also served as an editor. Uh, he's a native of Georgia. He spent his formative years in the Florida Panhandle, and he has ties, deep ties, here in Montgomery, where he also worked for a time at New South Books, which is the publisher of his book today, The South Never Plays Itself. So Ben's going to take us on a ride through the American Southern filmscape, the, the landscapes, the scenes, the really bad accents, all of it. So Ben, you come and share with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Uh, so the name of the book is The South Never Plays Itself, and uh, I'm Ben Beard, and I'm not an academic or a professor. I'm not a public speaker, uh, so I'm a little anxious. This is the first in-person event that I've done, too, so we're here together on a journey. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about me, uh, about the book, and then I'm going to show some film clips, and hopefully we'll have a nice, entertaining time together. Uh, this is uh, from a romantic comedy. Um, no. All right. So, this is the cover. And here we have Louise Brooks, who is a silent film star. Uh, I read this uh, on the way over here, uh, Lulu in Hollywood. She wrote this line near the end of the book, and it's about her, um, her sexual life and identity and how she grew up in the Bible Belt and never quite uh, let it go. I am coming at it differently. It resonated with me because I realized this is part of what I'm working through in the book is you don't escape, uh, recover, or recover from where you grow up in ways good and bad, and I haven't. And part of what I'm hoping to do is uh, unbuckle my Bible Belt. So. Hear about me. Uh, my mom's people. It wouldn't be a Southern thing if we didn't talk about our people. Uh, my mom's people grew up in East Texas back in the day. They were very poor. Uh, uh, they were farmers who couldn't make it. They migrated to Louisiana. And during the Great Depression, my grandparents met uh, both of them essentially homeless. Uh, my mom's dad got into the oil business in Louisiana as a uh, Delta Iron Works. He started a company that did basically like valves that they sold to uh, oilmen. And he, he made a living. He made, a, made a, a wealthy life for his family. So uh, my dad's people were Yankees. They were from Maine. And they were like riders and, and military colonels and so on. Uh, they're pedigree people. Uh, my dad had a wild childhood, though, and lived all over, and basically converted to the kind of Southern uh, cause uh, when he was about 17, 18. And my parents met at LSU, and uh, my dad was essentially bought into the whole Southern mythology, even though he has no, really no claim to it. Um, so I'm... My name is Benjamin Weston Beard, Jr., and my dad's name is Benjamin Weston Beard. In the Civil War, the story goes in my family that my uh, dad's ancestor, who was a Union um, captain, was, his life was saved by a soldier named Benjamin Weston. So he named his son Benjamin Weston Atwood. That was their last name. Who had a son who named his son Benjamin Weston Atwood Jr., who had a son who had a son named his son, Benjamin Weston Atwood III. My dad changed his name, and he went from Benjamin Weston Atwood the sixth to Benjamin Weston Beard, and so I became Benjamin Weston Beard Jr. And there's something about the name and my dad's shift to the Southern mindset that seems important to me. Uh, I have three daughters, and so the name it ends with me. There is no more Benjamin Westons. Uh, but, yeah. So I was born in Atlanta, and I grew up in Pensacola, and I was educated right here. And then I moved to Spain, and then to Illinois, Iowa, and, Illinois, uh, and then back to Illinois. I live in Chicago now. 
But I, uh, the, the through line to my life is, is the movies. And I've been a big fan since I was a child. Um, they are a way I can understand my life and understand the, the world I live in. And I know that sounds um, maybe dumb, but it's true. And I've been watching seriously maybe since I was about 14, 15, and then I uh, kicked it into overdrive in, in my 20s. Um, so all this to say, I turned to nonfiction. I, I was a writer. I never stopped writing. I turned to nonfiction, and all through this, I eventually landed on this topic. So here, what's this book about? Um, these are slightly sardonic questions, but it's a, this book's a kind of an alternative history of the movies. I start with Birth of a Nation, and I end with Free State of Jones, and I'm uh, uh, taking the history of the movies from the point of view of the South. Um, I took about eight years of watching and writing um, and the title comes from a Tom Anderson documentary. If you haven't seen it, Los Angeles plays itself. In it, he takes footage of Los Angeles and just narrates over it. Los Angeles is the most filmed city in the history of the world. And yet, it's the most misunderstood, according to Tom Anderson, and misrepresented because of the way it's filmed. It's often stitched together geographically, like a guy will go through one door in one building and it'll come out of a road like across the city because of the it's more compelling to do it that way. And so the point of the movie is that Los Angeles has been distorted through uh, the close attention and that in fact the movies have even though we wouldn't know Los Angeles without the films, they don't present a real Los Angeles to anybody. And so I was sort of playing off that uh, idea. So here's the first line of the book. I was born in the South, but I was raised on movies. So I'm not defending the South. This picture is of the segregated South, and here we have uh, a black citizen having to go upstairs to at a movie theater to watch the same movie uh, that uh, all the you know white folks get to watch in the good seats. I'm not defending the South in this book. I think we have a lot to to atone for and to answer for, and I think that until we answer for that, uh, our country is uh, going to be in turmoil. But I'm not going to condemn it either because. Um, but just look around, you know, the, the, the racial sins of America are not only down here. I live in Chicago, which is a wonderful place, way more segregated than Atlanta, than Memphis, than, you know, Pensacola. Uh, and there's um, animus and, and, and it, there's not, you know, interacting with people is awkward up there and it's different. So I'm not, I'm not here to condemn the South either, uh, not fully. So uh, I watched everything on TV as a kid and I watched uh, Thrasher movies and horror movies and Urban Avenger movies and gang movies. Uh, my mom forbid me to watch all this stuff, but I did it anyway. And back then, you know, you got some really wild stuff on TV. I watched Taxi Driver when I was 11. I watched Death, Twist, Death Wish when I was 12. This picture is from Basket Case, if there are any cinephiles in there. It scared the junk out of me as a kid. It's, I'm sure it's terrible. Um, but I formed in my mind a, a vision of uh, cities, uh, especially New York, because when you're a kid, all cities are New York. And in, in my mind, New York was a... Uh, dystopian hellscape uh, armed like armed people walking around you know mugging you beating you up shooting people all the time um, and so I went with with two people in here Randall and Foster we went together to New York City my first time when I was 22 years old and it, of course it was pleasant and, and, and great right and I was so nervous and looking around and anxious that I was gonna get mugged or or you know 
outed as a rube or a hayseed. And I realize now that you know, fiction's more powerful than reality. Uh, the New York in my mind was way stronger than the New York of the real world. And the South is the same problem. The South, uh, that's Burt Reynolds, if you didn't know. The South uh, in our minds, people who live here and people who don't live here, it's stronger than the, the, the South that exists in the real world. It's a real place, but it's also an idea. So who put the idea of the South, uh, and you can put your own version in there, who put that idea in, in your heads, right, in our heads? Who created this idea of the South that we carry around? People who live here and people who don't live here. And I would argue that it's the movies. Uh, the movies have immense power. Uh, uh, they are part mythology, uh, part documentary. They tell us about ourselves. They are uh, time capsules, right? They encapsulate like the time they came in. They also oftentimes are about an earlier time. So you have like, you have like the time you're watching it in, the time it was released, and the time it's about. And the movies are a, a vast tapestry. There's also thousands of them about the South, the thousands of American films about the South. Um, so I'm going to show a clip in just a second to, to uh, make this idea come home here. But I want to say a couple things. One, this is going to be a little inelegant because I have links to YouTube clips and there's going to be ads and stuff. So we just have to, you guys have to bear with me. Um, but this first clip I'm going to show you is not a movie. It's to show you how the power movies have in our reality. By the way, how bad were the Academy Awards this year? Did you see it? And the winner is a movie from South Korea. What the hell was that all about? We got enough problems with South Korea with trade. On top of it, they give them the best movie of the year. Was it good? I don't know. You know, I'm looking for like, where, where, let's get Gone with the Wind. Can we get like Gone with the Wind back, please? So he said that on the campaign trail, as COVID was kicking off, and he talks about Gone with the Wind, a movie that's 80 years old, and everyone knows why he's bringing it up, because it's powerful. It's part of the myth of our country, and it's part of the myth of the South. That's the President of the United States running for re-election in the middle of the, one of the biggest, it wasn't a, at the time, but a catastrophe like we've never seen before. And he's talking about Gone with the Wind. And he's talking about Parasite, which was a good movie, but it's weird. And it's because the movies are powerful. And they mean something. Um, I'm going to keep going here. So I was going to show clips from Alabama movies. I'm going to move to the clips. My little spiel is almost over. Uh, I've seen all these. Uh, you, I thought maybe you guys had seen all of these too. So I've, I've shifted my kind of presentation here. Um, but I am going to show, I'm going to start with a little clip from My Cousin Vinny, because it's very funny, and um, it elucidates the idea of the South as another country. And um, anybody not seen My Cousin Vinny? Do I have to introduce this? Okay. Well, it's an um, undereducated New Jersey guy comes to an Alabama courtroom to defend his uh, cousin, his uh, nephew, and I mean, a cousin, and um, you're going to see this is the opening kind of scene here. And if this yeah, adds, how do your clients plead? Uh, my clients are caught completely by surprise. They thought they were getting arrested for uh, shoplifting a can of tuna. What are you telling me? That they plead not guilty? No, I, I'm just trying to explain. I don't want to hear explanations. The state of Alabama has its procedure. And that procedure at this point in time is to have an arraignment. Are we clear on this? Uh, yes, but uh, there seems to be a great deal of confusion here. Mr. Gambini. Uh, see, my clients... Uh... Uh, Mr. Gambini. All the way. All I ask from you is a very simple answer to a very simple question. There are only two ways to answer it, guilty or not guilty. Your Honor, my clients didn't do anything. Once again, the communication process is broken down. 
<clears throat> it appears to me that you want to skip the arraignment process, go directly to trial, skip that, and get a dismissal. <laughs> well, I'm not about to revamp the entire judicial process just because you find yourself in the unique position of defending clients who say they didn't do it. Now, next words out of your mouth are either going to be guilty or not guilty. I don't want to hear commentary, argument, or opinion. If I hear anything other than guilty or not guilty, you'll be in contempt. I don't even want to hear you clear your throat. I hope I've been clear. Now, how do your clients plead? Yeah, how do your clients plead? All right, sorry. So he says there, once again, that communication uh, has broken down. And I feel like having lived here and then outside of the South, oftentimes it is like it, the problem of communication breaking down is that people aren't quite having the same conversation, um, like Vinny and the judge. Um, all right, so I'm going to go through, I'm going to show you what I, you know, through eight years of really a lifetime of watching movies, uh, I uh, came across these different visions of the South that the movies gave us. I'm going to try, I've tried to avoid some of the bigger films that people know about, and, um, but you're going to recognize some of them. And I'm just going to introduce some, uh, talk around for a little bit, and then we're going to watch the film clips. And it's, again, you should be entertained and feel wiser and, and better about humanity when I'm done. So um, there's a whole movie, the uh, type of movie, The South, filled with uh, kind of parasitic, uh, uh, violent uh, country people. And there's a ton of these. Uh, the most famous being Deliverance, which is a truly, it is a great film. And it's also a complete lie. Uh, in that film, some guys go on a canoeing trip. They come across some inbred hillbillies who uh, try to kill them after assaulting them in the woods. Uh, I've been lost in the country, and people the worst thing that's happened to me is people have been friendly and offered to help me. But it is a great film. But I'm not going to show a clip from Deliverance. I'm going to show a clip from Tobacco Roads. From 1941, uh, John Ford directed this. Easily one of the most famous American directors one of the great American directors. Uh, and he was on a string of great films when he made this, and this was made one year after Grapes of, Grapes of Wrath. And it's made about the same kind of people. But in the Grapes of Wrath, the poor country folk uh, have integrity. They are um, striving to, to survive a system that's trying to destroy them. This is not the same kind of movie. Uh, this shows some Georgia farmers who are in the direst of circumstances, and it portrays them with a great writer and a, a top cast and a great director. It portrays them as, as you know, Morlocks. They are parasites of the worst kind. Um, and I'll just quickly, Erskine Caldwell is a Georgia writer that somehow manages to still have people who read him. He's terrible. Uh, he's, he's mean, uh, he's lascivious and not in a sexy way, uh, and he has terrible his taste. Um, but this was a, a big, big novel, Tobacco Road. So I'm going to show you this clip. This is the whole film is on YouTube, so I might have to kind of move it, but all you're going to see is Ward Bond is, has married Pearl, part of this family uh, that you're going to see. And Pearl's not talking to him, so he goes to the family and says, hey, you got to get her to talk to me, right? And you're going to see what happens. Um, it's, uh, it's grotesque. It was also a big, it was a popular film. All right. Oh. So here's Ward Bond, and he has a croaker sack of turnips. And all I want you to keep in mind is Grace of Wrath while you're watching this, okay? There's a lot of things she could ask me. She won't say one darn word. Well, maybe you don't go about it right. Well, I tried every way I know how. I kicked her and I poured water on her and I chunk rocks and sticks at her and all she does is bawl a lot when she's hurt. You can't call that talking. Well, her not talking ain't, ain't anything to get mad about. Why, ain't you here never, never spoke a word to me for the first ten years we were married. <laughs> and then we, uh, 
Happiest 10 years of my life. She runs away, too. I'm getting sick and tired of the whole business. Give her time, boy. She, she'll be all right. She ain't but 13, remember? You listen to me, love, Benzie. If you don't like what she's doing, you just bring her back home and get yourself another wife. You can have Ellie May. Oh, every time I say anything, you all want me to marry Ellie May. Well, it ain't no use. That's all there is to it. I want a young wife. I ain't gonna take no 23-year-old woman for a wife. Have everybody laughing at me. Hey, love. Yo, Ellie Mae. That's plural I'm talking about. Love, will you, will you tell me what it is you've got in that, that croaker sack? I've been looking at it ever since you come here, and Lord knows I'm just dying to know. Turn us by cracking. Turn us. I ain't... I ain't had me a good turnip since since a year ago last spring, you know. The good Lord only knows how bad I wanted one. But, you know, I could, I could eat me a whole croaker sack full of I could eat me a whole wagon load full of turnips between between now and sundown. You don't need a look for me to give you none, because I ain't. That's a, a whopping mean thing to say to her poor old pa. Ain't you going to give me just a bite, love? No. I'll tell you what I'll do, love. I'll, I'll make you trade for some of them I turn up. I ain't trading turnips with nobody. I'll tell you what, if you'll give me some of them turnips, I'll, I'll go down to your house the, the first thing in the morning and I'll, I'll tell her if she's got to behave herself. I'll tell her that, that that ain't no way to, to treat a man who's gone to the father of marrying her. I'll tell her she's got to stop hiding in them bushes and ask if it's going to rain. And... Oh, you're going to get your hair cut. <laughs> what do you say, love? I don't got to pay you for that. I already give you some quilts and two quarts of cylinder oil and seven dollars to marry Pearl. And that's enough. You got to make her behave for nothing. Just one little bitty bite, love. Ain't no use you niggling at me. children all the time blaming me because the oh good lord made me poverty stricken and them and them all all the time calling me out because they, they ain't got nothing to eat as if, as if i had anything to do with it yes. sometimes it looks to me and it looks to me like the good lord got it in good and plenty for a poor man but and i ain't complaining no sir i ain't complaining oh, oh. I'm going to stop it there. Uh, it's a wild movie, and but it gives us it was a, it was a big release, but it gives us this uh, uh, terrifying and, and really distorted vision of, of you know poor Southern people who were struggling. Um, and I mean, it's funny. I mean, the movie is it is kind of well made, but it's also hateful, you know. And I just thought the Grapes of Wrath coming out the year before. Um, which is, it's a good movie, but their, their hardship isn't, they're not mocking, the movie's not mocking them. And in this, the movie mocks them the whole time. Um, I'm going to keep going. So, the South has a playground for the idle rich. This is a whole type of film. Often in plantation times, you'll have movies, they, especially in the 30s and uh, early f the 40s, you'll have pictures about uh, wealthy uh, landowners and white people misbehaving, being jerks to each other, uh, uh, going to balls. And this film was written by my great, great uncle. Remember I said my dad's side had some writers in it. He, he Owen Davis, he, he, he wrote this. Uh, and this is famous because um, Warner Brothers rushed it out to get out ahead of Gone with the Wind. They, everyone knew Gone with the Wind was going to be a, a smash. And Betty Davis was supposed to be Scarlet. Uh, uh, she was the lead consideration. And the, the mythology goes that uh, they wanted to play opposite Errol Flynn, and she thought Errol Flynn was a bad actor, and so she was like, I'm not going to act with him, and then they, like, moved on. Um, but so she plays a similar character in Jezebel. It's set in New Orleans. It's in pre-Civil War, and uh, unlike a lot of the films of the era, there is slavery is part of the story. Uh, the, uh, she is manipulating different men in her life who are on opposite sides of the slavery issue, and she basically kind of gets them into a duel. This scene is not, uh, I just like it. It's not necessarily the most emblematic scene, 
But if you've never seen a film by William Wyler, uh, everything he did uh, had a, uh, a touch of class. He's one of the great uh, visual directors. And in the, this movie also has Henry Fonda, who is just a tall drink of water. And the scene, uh, Fonda and Davis are going to a ball, and it's black and white, but she's wearing a red dress, which is like, you know. And you'll see um, just how everyone responds. And in a way, it does, who cares if she's wearing a red dress when we're about to go into the Civil War, right? But like, that's sort of, these films, they're about manners and, and uh, people being polite but really bitchy to each other at the same time. Um, so this is Jezebel, and I don't know why it always starts right there. Okay, this is from, here we go. Gentlemen, you all have the privilege of Miss Martin's acquaintance, I think. Jim. Miss Martin. Good evening, Buck. Good evening, Buck. Uh, Miss Martin. We were just fixing to pour us a little libation. That's right. Shall we see you later? Excuse me. Oh, there's my partner now. Uh, excuse me, please. You have no partner you have to meet, Cantrell. Well, I know. Okay. I'm going to stop it there. Um, it's uh, it's a good movie, and if you if you if you're feeling like ah, I kind of want to throw on Gone with the Wind, but I don't want to spend three and a half hours, maybe watch Jezebel. It's only 95 minutes. Um, I love that line. It's like I was just fixing to pour myself a libation. Um, The South is Abandoned by God. You know, one way to watch movies, when I was doing this, I watched so many films, I started looking in the background, like uh, the landscapes and stuff. And um, Sling Blade came out in 1996, and um, it's aged really well, actually. If you haven't seen it, uh, it follows, it's in Arkansas, and Billy Bob Thornton directs it, and he plays a uh, uh, disabled, mentally disabled guy. And he has murdered two people before the film begins, and he's been in a... Um, hospital and they're letting him go and he's still dangerous and no one because people underestimate him no one sees him as dangerous but he is in fact someone says like you're not going to murder anyone else are you and he was like i don't see any reason to but he you know he's going to uh, don't mean to spoil it but so you know here um this none of that has to do with the scene this scene is the south that's been spoiled and um abandoned and you're just going to see a guy walking down the road and then through a, a house that uh, is, um, had been wrecked by like a, looks like a tornado or something. But there's a feeling in a lot of the movies set in the South that, that uh, something's going wrong and that there's not, that maybe God or something else has, has moved away. And this is one of those films. Um, and I'm, and eventually an ad's going to pop up on YouTube, so I'm sorry, you know, but we'll, hopefully we'll. Um, 
if you're a anecdote type person, uh, Robert Duvall is in Sling Blade. He plays Billy Bob Thornton's dad, and Billy Bob Thornton was in The Apostle, like around the same time. They clearly were like, "Hey, I'll be in your movie. Be mine." Uh, that shed, he looks in. It's clear that he's been beaten. It. He was beaten in there as a child, and uh, it also ties. This movie also ties into that like gothic, like the South is you know filled with just. Uh, um, uh, violence and, and, and family secrets and so you know the real one of the real problems I think with the movies is is that they were um, for reasons that are obvious and not obvious they were selling a vision of the South uh, that left out black Americans uh, and I came across an early film um, uh, independent feature from 1964, which just blew me away. It's one of the best movies I, I saw. Um, and it's uh, a love story between two uh, black Southerners. They're uh, real attractive people. They're young. They're struggling because they live in Alabama. And um, I just, you know, why aren't there more movies like this? You know, I mean, I know why, but still, it was, it's wonderful. If you are a movie fan, you might have heard of The Exiles, which follows American Indians in uh, Los Angeles. It's a similar thing. It's black and white. It took a long time to make, uh, but it's wonderful. Uh, and this movie follows Duff, um, who's the guy, and he can't get ahead. And he can't, uh, he can't, he can't breathe because the, the country won't let him and the society won't let him. And so, but the scene I've picked, uh, it's, it's filmed outside of Birmingham and it's uh, uh, in, industrial, there's manufacturing. You're gonna look, it looks like post-war England. He, they get on a bus and you're gonna see like a mound of refuse. It's like, what's happening here? And then you're gonna see him walking through a, a neighborhood of Birmingham. And this was filmed in the 60s and I just, we, we, you know, this is an America that's so rarely on screen until recently. Uh, I'm gonna show it now. And this is the whole film. <laughs> See, sorry. So here we go. They're on their date, an early date, and then they're going to go. They run into each other on the bus. That's tough. Just for the day. I want to see my kid. I didn't know you had one. Yeah. Are you married? No, I ain't married. Well, I'm back. Going in to do my shopping. Oh, it's just a coincidence, huh? That's right. <laughs> okay, I'll see you later. Good here, Doug. No point running away from coincidence. Maybe you must be crazy. Stop it there. You, if you haven't seen it, it's it's truly uh, it's a great film, and um, it's funny and romantic. But Duff is he gets meaner as the movie goes on because he can't uh, uh, he can't get ahead, you know, and he's uh, passed over for a job at a plan and he's mistreated. But it's it's truly it's wonderful, um, and one of the kind of gems that I fell across, I came across. Um, 
So the South is a Christ haunted place, right? We all, you know, are familiar with that. Um, yeah, they only made one Flannery O'Connor uh, story or, or book into a movie, and this was her first novel, Wise Blood. And it's if you haven't read it, it's great. It's it's funny and and it's it's wonderful. I, I don't know why it doesn't have a higher reputation. Um, it follows these two um, losers in Macon, Georgia. I think they're in Macon. It's filmed in Macon. And one of them is a street preacher who's preaching the Church of Christ with no Christ. And there's no salvation. And he's um, not getting anywhere. People are ignoring him. But he comes across these other street preachers who one of them tries to like glom onto him and like he thinks there's some money in this. And then another one who tries to, to um, intimidate him out of like preaching on the street. Now, why am I including this? A couple reasons. One, John Huston made two great films in the 70s, uh, Fat City, which is also a great novel, and this one. Uh, two, it's um, urban and scary. It looks like an act scene out of Taxi Driver, and it has a wonderful performance from Brad Dourif, and um, I don't know why this movie's not better now. It's hard, it's disturbing, but that's Flannery O'Connor, but it's very funny. Uh, this scene, Brad Dourif is on a car and everyone's ignoring him. And Ned Beatty, who he's never met before, walks up and st starts to like, he's the guy who's like, I'm going to make money off this. And when I grew up, this was a thing. I don't know if they still do it, but in Pensacola, there were street preachers out there yelling at people when they went into restaurants and, you know, coming out of bars and stuff. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to show you this uh, 1979's Wise Blood. And uh, again, eventually we're going to get an ad. Well, maybe not. Well, go on and go. But remember, the truth don't lurk around every street corner. You folks, you folks, come on, come on, come on, you folks, stay now. Come back here. Come on, come on back here. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Come on. Come on, I stay. I just fixed to tell you all about me. I wish I had my guitar. <laughs> uh, somehow, it's just easier for me to say some sweet with music rather than just just plain listen to me friends before i met this prophet here i didn't have a friend in this world do any of you know what it means not to have a friend in the world there ain't no worse than nobody who wouldn't stick a knife in your back when you wasn't looking oh you said a mouthful when you said that friend everybody friends i want to introduce myself to you my name is Oni J. Holy, and I am a preacher. I don't, I don't mind you knowing that, but I don't, I don't want you to believe anything. And I wouldn't ask you to believe anything that you did not feel right in your own hearts. Friends, everybody that's born onto this earth is full of sweetness and love. You know that when a child gets bigger, that sweetness just doesn't show so good, does it? I mean, troubles come to perplex him, folks. I mean, the sweetness gets driven inside. Then he becomes miserable and lonesome and, and sick. And, you know, he starts to say, now where's my sweetness gone? Or if somebody's lost their sweetness, friends, they might just despair completely. Huh? I mean, despair. Now, that, that's the way it was with me, friends. I know what of I speak here. Before I met the prophet, before I found out he was out here to help me, I mean, he's out here preaching the, the church of Christ without Christ. Now, I want you to all to listen to him. I want you to listen to him and to me, and I want you to join our church, the holy church of Jesus Christ without Christ. That, that man ain't true. I, I never seen him before. Right, I'm going to stop it. So... It's too dark. I am sorry. Uh, it's dark. Yeah, the, the visuals are dark. So I, I will say, you know, uh, I was very religious as a child. I'm not anymore. But uh, religion on screen gets a, you know, it's usually a demonic uh, power. Um, it's very rarely treated. Um, I mean, it doesn't need to be treated respectfully, but it's very rarely treated fairly. And um, this movie, though, the, you know, they're all they're all hustlers. It's not it's not mocking um, any, you know, church or anything. Uh, anyway, very, very wonderful film, very funny, uh, very disturbing, Flannery O'Connor. And I always th thought they should string together a few of her stories into a, a film, and it would be, um, you know, be like one of the best films about the South. I think they are making a, um, 
a good man is hard to find. I, I saw that they are, that's in production. All right, South is more violent than the rest of America. Uh, true, not true, right? I, I don't know. Um, Louisiana per capita is the most violent state in the union. Uh, you would never know that reading the newspaper. Um, I could have picked a thousand films. I picked Mud. Uh, mud resonated with me. I did not grow up. I grew up in Pensacola's bayous and water everywhere. I hate boats. I was never a boater. I was never a hunter. But I knew kids like it in this film. It follows these two kids who are kind of on their own. They're pretty wild. They're on the edge of a suburb. And um, they come across Matthew McConaughey, who's uh, living on an island um, as an outlaw. You know, he's on the run from the law. It's very good. The director has made a couple of films, Loving, um, uh, Midnight Special, which is a weird southern sci-fi movie, uh, Shotgun Stories, and, um, and this, and, and one more. Anyway, very, very good. Uh, the best movies in the South, I, I found, are also good films, right? And the opposite is true. Uh, so this scene has a kid. You're just going to see the two kids. They're in a truck across the street, and he's watching this girl he has a crush on, and then he walks across the street and punches a guy in the mouth. Um, kid just like that. Um, I was going to do a scene from Joe, also a pretty good film. Ty Sheridan plays it. And in that film, uh, he beats up an adult on a bridge. And it was just, I thought it might be too coarse. I didn't know who's going to be here. But uh, Joe has a, the, almost the same scene. But he, he, an adult is, is pushing Ty Sheridan around. And he doesn't realize that Ty Sheridan's been on, like, independent on his own his whole life and that he's actually quite dangerous. Um, I don't know if the South is more violent. I just, that's like something I came across. Uh, a good example is Easy Rider, if you haven't seen. I mean, a good film, but at the end of the movie, the two guys get shotgunned on the side of the road because they have long hair. And they get killed because they're in the South and they don't belong. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to, I got to speed it up. South is dominated by women. My aunt, who lives in Virginia, but uh, my dad's uh, sister, but she grew up in, um, in the North. She always returns to this, that it's the women who actually run things down here. Um, and, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of great women writers who come from the South. I don't know why. They seem to be more, more women novelists who can, like, kick ass, come from here than from around the country. Um, but in the 90s, a whole bunch of these, uh, you know, films about women uh, appeared from the South. Miss Firecracker, quite good. Drive Miss Daisy. I'm not going to get into that right now. Down on the Delta, uh, a great film. Um, Fried Green Tomatoes, which, you know, I wasn't crazy about. And then this, Steel Magnolias, which is a, a you know, very famous film. Uh, this scene is just fun. It's a minute long, and you're going to see women being mean to each other. Uh, Shirley MacLaine, who is, you know, uh, one of the great uh, actors, you're going to see she's at, they're at a wedding, and she's mad at Tom Skerritt, who's her husband, and then they're later, they're just, uh, she and... Um, Olympia Dukakis are making fun of a woman who's dancing. Uh, but uh, Sorry. Okay, here we go. I'm not speaking to you. Shame. I mean it, Tom. Wazer, can we call a truce long enough for me to get peace, Kate? Thanks, Wazer. That's my good piece of ass. Dollars for that dress and don't even bother to wear a girdle. Looks like two pigs fighting on the blanket. <laughs> Oh, oh, fantastic fantastic party. <laughs> Weezer, Weezer, there's someone I'd like you to meet. That looks like an autopsy. Now, this is Jackson Zan Fern Cork from Alexandria. She made the cake. You did this. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> it's very simple, really. It just takes patience. You only do armadillos? No, I can do anything. Except snakes. I don't have the counter space. All 
I'm just going to stop it right there. So uh, that's a movie ever, a lot of people have seen. And um, I didn't, that's not the South I grew up in uh, at all. But my mom, you know, in uh, home Louisiana, there was a touch of that, I think. Um, yeah. All right, I got to speed it up. I got to, okay. You know, I might skip Norma Ray. Okay, I think I'm going to skip this one. But there's, you know, there's labor activism in Alabama still, right? You had the whole stuff with Amazon and Bessemer and um, Harlan County, USA. It's one of the greatest documentaries. It's about a, a, a labor strike in West Virginia. If you haven't seen it, it's wonderful. Uh, Norma Ray surprised me. It was better than I was expecting. Uh, I thought it was going to be homework. And I don't believe in movies as homework or medicine, but it was, it was quite good. But I'm going to skip this one because I'm going to run out of time. And I think you guys are showing it. Uh, I think the archives are showing Norma Ray, right? Yeah, so you'll watch it there. Um, so the South is funny, tense, and strange. I think starting about 2010, the movie set in the South started to have a more um, nuance and complexity. This was one of the, this movie really blew me away, Queen and Slim, and the ending is terrible, but the rest of the movie is wonderful. And it follows a young, uh, they're on their first date, a uh, young black couple, uh, they're not a couple. They're on their first date and a cop pulls them over and they shoot him. He's gonna shoot them, basically, and they shoot him. And it's uh, Steve, uh, country singer plays the cop. Uh, I'll think of his name in a minute. So they, have to flee and they become outlaws and it's a kind of Bonnie and Clyde story but they're um, they're innocent and they flee to the south where they start to find shelter uh, because people look out for each other in, in, the, in this movie. This scene though has nothing to do with any of that. Uh, they're on the run and he needs gas, uh, the lead, Daniel Kalua, and he uh, He's going to rob the gas station, and it doesn't work. And this scene um, is wonderful and a very good film. Again, if you are going to watch it on my recommendation, though, the ending is bad. Uh, great, great movie if you haven't seen it. And uh, I could have also done the gas station scene from No Country for Old Men, right? Like, uh, I'm going to end. I'm, I'm out of time, but I'm going to do one more. Uh, South is a religious place, uh, good and bad. June Bug's a movie a lot of people have seen. I, I didn't know it. I mean, you know, I didn't know it was a big movie in the South, but... Um, it came out in 2005. Uh, I was raised Southern Baptist and I haven't recovered uh, yet. But I will say, I still, I do think the church in movies gets a bad rap. And it's not my home anymore, but it gets a bad rap. And I think belief in God is, uh, you can't really explain it, right? And films that try to fail. This film doesn't try to explain it. And this movie follows a young couple who meet in Chicago. Uh, the woman is British and she has an art, uh, uh, gallery and the man is from North Carolina. They get married quickly before she meets his family and then she goes down to North Carolina with him because there's a folk artist she wants to sign for her art gallery. There she discovers facets of her husband that she just didn't know existed and in this scene they're at like a church barbecue and her husband gets called up to sing a hymn in front of like 200 people. Now, that's not uncommon to, in my childhood, but she d d has no frame of reference. The thing that makes this film great and the scene powerful is usually you'd see her like cry and realize, oh man, I've been wrong about religion my whole life. But that's not what happens. I'll let you interpret it your own way. But um, she's not happy that he's a good singer and singing a hymn in front of all these people. And you'll know who she is right away. She's uh, in the foreground. And you don't need to know anything else about the film. Um, and then I'll, I'm going to, I'll stop with this. Softly That's and husband. tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, oh sinner, 
I hate to stop in the middle of the hymn, but I'm going to stop it there. Um, I say it in the book, but if you're going to watch one movie, you know, on my recommendation, I would probably say June book. Um, you know, I'm back to the, you can't unbuckle the Bible belt. I, I didn't, I don't know if I came to any conclusion about uh, uh, where I grew up, and uh, I, I didn't. I didn't discover any new thing about myself or about uh, America necessarily. I did watch some good books, but I mean movies. But I do think um, we have to work through our uh, ambiguous feelings about the complexity of the South as a real place and an idea for our country to have any hope for survival. And I know that's a grim end to it, but um, all right, that's it for me. I know I was so good, <laughs> right? What's the, no, what's the movie? I was thinking of, did you ever wonder who fired the gun? Was what I was first thinking. I did watch that recently. Stephen Birmingham, he runs a pawn shop, and these two women bring in the Civil War veteran, who's been killed by Indians, and they bring him to the Civil War I didn't see it. You should have written this book, Kevin. Uh, but I will say uh, uh, there aren't many movies about the Civil War, right? I mean, there's a handful. Yeah, yeah. Handful, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious. You know, if this book had been written done in the 1800s, would you have been able to make the same You know, I've, I lived in Iowa. I think Iowa has enough. It's not, I, not the region, but Iowa has a lot of movies. Like, Iowa on screen is always Iowa. Uh, I dis did discover that, like, if you want to be in Nowheresville, USA, you'll set in Indiana or Ohio. But you don't set a movie in Texas unless you want to talk about Texas or Florida. There's no reason, and it never happens. If you've set something in Florida because you want Florida to be part of the story, right? Same for Alabama. The only exception in the South is Atlanta because of the film, the, uh, what are they calling it? Dixie Wood or something. The Southern Hollywood in Atlanta that's starting to break apart now, but that's the, Atlanta's the only neutral space in the South where you'd like, you'll see a film there where it's like, it doesn't matter that it's in Atlanta. So the regions, yeah, I mean, you got New York City and Los Angeles, right? And then you got flyover country that like no one in Hollywood really cares about. You have Iowa, I think you could do, uh, Iowa has its own kind of feel on screen, Field of Dreams uh, is a good example. Um, but no, I don't think you could do a book on the Midwest, films in the Midwest, because it would just be like, here's one place, and here's another place, and here's another place. And the Northeast, no. Uh, and I think, in a way, it's sad, right? Because those places have identities, too. There's no regional cinema in America, really. So you have, you know, Jeff Nichols in Arkansas, and you got the, I put in the book, um, Breaking Away, that bike, great bike movie in Indiana. But besides, I can't think of movies that like pull on the local culture of like uh, Montana. I mean, there are some movies set in Montana, but they're not, you know, they really just want the mountains in the background. I would love to do that.
Thanks, everybody. I'll just leave my other face up.